Okay, today we're, we're done with electron configurations, finally, so we're going to start looking at periodic trends, um, how things about atoms change on the periodic table as you go across or down or whatever. Um, most of the um, periodic properties really go back to the nuclear force acting on the electrons. So we'll, we'll pick up with that with effective nuclear force. Um, you'll first recall that we talked about the shielding effect way back last chapter. Let's recap that real quickly because that's going to have a huge uh, effect on, on the nuclear force on electrons. Um, notice you have your inner 1s electrons here in green and then the level 2s electrons in red, 3s in blue. Uh, these are radial probability distributions. So the 1s electrons are spending a lot of time around a distance labeled 1 on this stupid chart here. Um, the 2s and the 2p, I just noticed the p is a b, that's weird. Um, they're both sending, spending a lot of time out around 4 or 5 units from the nucleus further away. These 1s electrons in that electron cloud are directly between the nucleus here at 0 and these level 2 electrons out here. And so these level two electrons will feel less force than they should have because they're shielded by those inner electrons. Now, notice the 2s electrons have this little lump of density in closer to the nucleus. We refer to that again as penetration. The 2s electrons can penetrate through the shield and therefore are going to be more, um, more tightly held. The two p electrons have less penetration. That means they're more shielded and more loosely held. And that's why you'll recall when we were giving away our electrons, the p's went first because they're more loosely held. Um, this also, you may recall, explains the non-degeneracy of the sublevels in multi-electron atoms. With hydrogen, you only have one electron. There's nothing to shield. With everything else, you have stuff down here in 1s, and it's going to shield the outer electrons. So, again, that's a nice recap of the shielding effect as we've talked about it. Now, the nuclear force itself is essentially Z, the number of protons, the atomic number. Remember Z from back in Chapter 2 or whenever it was. So, they, that's the nuclear force, but each electron is going to feel less than that force um, because... They, they're different distances from the nucleus and there's different shielding effects on each electron. So Z effective is the effective nuclear force, the force that the electron actually feels, not the true force that the nucleus is putting out because, because again, shielding and all that stuff. So the important thing to realize is Z effective will decrease as you increase number of shielding electrons. Okay? So, for example, as you go... Um, down the periodic table, you're going to have um, more and more shielding electrons in between uh, because you're going to greater and greater levels. Down here in level 7, there's six levels in between shielding. So that means there's more shielding and less effective nuclear force. So as you go down a column, your nuclear force is going to decrease. On this diagram, they show it increasing going up. Same thing, right? And that's because you have more intervening electrons. Um, going across the periodic table, you're in the same shell. Going across right here, we're in shell two. So there's only one shell, the, the, the 1s2 electrons intervening no matter what. But as we go, we're adding protons to the nucleus. Okay, there's only three protons here for lithium. There's like 10 over here for neon. 10 protons, but still only shielded by two, 1s2. There's going to be a more nuclear force, more effective nuclear force there. So effective nuclear force increases going across and it decreases going down. The way we mathematically handle that is Z effective will equal Z, the true nuclear force, minus this sigma, which is a shielding constant. Um, the shielding constant, a lot of factors go into that, but we can approximate it, that's what this wavy equal sign means, by saying that the, the sigma, the shielding constant, is approximately equal to the number of core electrons. So again, if we go across period two, 1s2 is the core, so it's just two core electrons. 
uh, for lithium right here, you have three protons. That Z minus two, cor two core electrons gives you an effective nuclear force of one. Going across to, well, let's do the next element right next to it, which is beryllium. You now have four protons in the nucleus. That's your Z minus still only two core electrons gives you an effective nuclear force of two. So you see how nuclear force, effective nuclear force, has gone up as we went across. All right. Um, uh, so yeah, right here where it says, oops, where it says Z effective stays the same across, um, Z effective actually increases going across. So I got to fix that. Um, so Z effective increases going across, Z effective decreases going down. Those are the kind of trends we'll be looking at on the periodic table. What happens as you go across? What happens as you go down? So now with that, let's look at how it affects atomic radius. We'll leave a ton of Lily bionic radius for tomorrow. So atomic radius, what we mean by that is effectively the size of the atom. Um, they measure it by crystallizing it and measuring how close two nuclei are, are to each other. That would be a diameter, and so half that distance is the, the radius. Not terribly important to us, but that's how they measure it. As you go down, I'll just finish revealing all this. Um, as you go down a column, your atomic radius is going to increase. The reason for that is pretty obvious. As you go down, you're adding more and more shells. Hydrogen way up here is level one. Lithium below it is level two, and we know the n quantum number makes it bigger. Um, below that, you got sodium. Well, that's level three, so it's getting bigger yet. Francium down here with 1s7 or 7s1 is huge. So as you go down a column, they get bigger because you're going to bigger n quantum numbers and getting bigger and bigger shells. As you go across a row, a period, you're in the same shell. So we're going across here, for example, we got lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, over to neon. We're all in level two. So you would think they stay all the same size because level two is level two. But don't forget, the effective nuclear force is increasing. So as you go across, yeah, it's the same shell, but that same shell is being pulled in tighter and tighter by a stronger nuclear force. And so level two shrinks as you go across that period. Go down to the period three. Now we're in level three. It's bigger. Go across period three level that that shell three is shrinking as you go across again. Then you're back to level four. It's bigger. So as you're going down, they're getting bigger. As you're going across, they're shrinking. Again, getting bigger going down because of increased size of shells. Going across, getting smaller because same shell getting pulled in by stronger and stronger is the effective. So. The little triamese down here, who's bigger, calcium or strontium? You look on your periodic table, calcium's up here in the alkali metals, or sorry, the alkaline earth metals. Strontium's down here in the alkaline earth metals, not that far, down about here. So you're in the same column. We can compare them. Going down, they're getting bigger, so strontium must be bigger than calcium. The other one, calcium or zinc? Well, calcium is here. Zinc is over here. They're in the same row, so we can compare them. As you go across, they get smaller, so it looks like zinc is smaller, calcium is bigger. Now, notice we've compared them in the same row or the same column. If you're comparing outside of that, sometimes it's difficult to tell. Um, if, the bo if both trends agree with each other, it's pretty obvious. If I compare something, say, here to something over here, um, well, I'm sorry, something here is this thing over there. Both say, trends are saying this one's smaller, this one, well, I was right the first time, this one's smaller, this one's bigger, so that one wins. If we go the other diagonal, it's a little unclear. In general, the downward trend is more extreme than the across trend, because in the across trend, it's the same shell just shrinking a little bit. In the downward trend, it's new shells growing really bigger. So when in doubt, the downward trend probably wins. Okay, so question, who's the biggest atom of them all?
well, they increase going down, so somewhere at the bottom is the biggest element. They decrease going across, so they're getting bigger going back. Looks like down here, Francium, he's a big boy. That's the, the biggest atom on the periodic table. Who's the smallest? Well, decreasing going across must be on the right. Decreasing going up must be helium down over here, the tiniest atom of them all. Now, the noble gases don't get involved in reactions, so other than that, other than the noble gases, our smallest one we're going to have is fluorine over here. You'll notice way, way back we talked about fluorine being the most reactive nonmetal. That's why. We'll look at the reasons for that later, but size matters for elements. And down here, fluorine or francium, the most reactive metal, at least theoretically, we never had enough of it to see. But as you move away, they get more, they get less reactive. Again, we'll look in more detail at those trends and why they're true, why it relates so much to radius in, in coming days. But these atomic radii are more than just theoretical. They're really important drivers of, of their chemical properties. All right, last slide of this, I believe. Here's a cool graph showing how atomic radius works. Um, on the along the bottom here, we're looking at atomic number, so number of protons. From hydrogen here with one proton, um, here you got lithium, hydrogen, and helium are kind of mashed together there. It's hard to see the difference. Here you got lithium with three, beryllium uh, with four, boron, carbon, nitrogen, over to at neon with 10. Notice the trend here. If you look at hydrogen and then lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, you're increasing going down that column. Now, looking here, going across the second row, right here you have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on over the noble gas at the end. Notice as you go across that row, you're shrinking. Now you end it with the noble gas, you jump to sodium, it's big again. You shrink across the row, you start the next row, it's big again. Shrinking across the row, and so on. Notice in the transition metals, there's a little bit of regularity there, especially weird stuff here when you get to the lanthanides. You know, we don't even worry about those. But in general, the atomic radius trend holds pretty true. And so this is a nice one to graph. Will I make you graph this on your own? Yeah, probably. Okay, we'll leave ionic radius for tomorrow's lesson. Um, I'm going to put up a worksheet for atomic radius just to give you a little practice playing around with who's bigger, who's smaller, and why. And then we'll take it from there. All right, have a good day.